All right. Let's see. Morning. I'm Beck Lane. This is Catalyst and Company. Catalyst and Company, where we're catalysts in each other's lives as well as our own. And we work at being the artists we've always wanted to be. It's kind of dark in here, so the, the uh, video is going to be a little grainy. But we're used to things being a little off with me. Uh, but it is about, I think about 5.30 in the morning. I've been up for an hour. Just kind of thinking and thinking and thinking. As we do. Uh, yesterday was um, was a disappointing a disappointing day. And all all artists, all people who are trying to get the venture up off the ground, <laughs> know those days where you know you're pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. And in, in this this particular instance, for pretty explicitly for 12 years, implicitly for several decades, but the, the true focus has been over the past 12 years. And um, Eric, our, our friend Eric, asked me uh, to talk about imposter syndrome. And this was a long while ago. I'm sorry, I'm keeping it quiet because I do have a neighbor on the other side of the wall. So I'm sorry about the, the lack of volume. But our friend Eric asked me to talk about imposter syndrome a while ago. And I said to him, I, I don't understand it. And I can't address something I don't understand. Uh, but I don't understand imposter syndrome. I don't walk in a room or have my art, the more important thing is, or have my artwork in a room and doubt myself. I might doubt like one, I, I might know, not doubt, but know one painting is off. I'll know that it's, there's just, it's not right. And what I usually do in that instance is I just take it off the, the stretcher and throw it away because I don't want product out there that isn't right. Um, but when I walk in a room, I don't doubt my art, for the most part, I don't doubt my artwork, I don't doubt my abilities. In fact, I have a healthy ego, and I could say that in a way to make everybody laugh and put myself down, but it's true, I don't doubt my abilities. And I actually find it deeply offensive when people um, imply that, not that I should, because most people don't, but just that, um, you know, if, if you're not at the success level that you want to be at, maybe... Um, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think, I'm sorry, because it is 5.30 in the morning, so I'm still tired. But that it's somehow your fault. I could accept the fact um, that I'm not where I want to be because I've only done one painting a week, I'm a weekend painter, and or one painting a month or whatever, and I'm just doodling. But when you work as hard as we do, we... I can't accept it, and we shouldn't accept it. And we talk about um, uh, imposter syndrome aside, we talk about uh, Alice Neal, Yeyu Kusama, um, Frida Kahlo, our friend Vincent. We talk, I talk about them a lot. We talk about them a lot. We share about them a lot. Because these, and it, it is, again, with intent, another subject of ours lately. Because these are people who, when they were alive, were told, mm. 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 and it is to prove how stupid the you know culture can be, how stupid, utterly stupid and blind society can be. 
when it comes to the visual arts or writing, Herman Melville, writing. Um, oh my God, I can think of a million people, where, millions and millions of people, where society has gone, mm. windshield wipers, that's dumb. And then all of a sudden, windshield wipers are not dumb. Recently, I saw a movie, it said the same thing. Uh, designer shoes, that's dumb. Designer basketball shoes, that's dumb. And then all of a sudden, we've got Michael Jordan as a brand. Michael Jordan, well, I mean, Nikes as a brand. <laughs> You're dumb, you're dumb, you're dumb, you're stupid, you should give up. You, you know, you're, you're thinking too grandly of yourself. You're thinking too highly of your, your abilities. And then all of a sudden we're not. All of a sudden we are Yeyo Kusama and we're 94 years old and we're still working and people around the world are celebrating her artwork and purchasing her artwork at 94 now. When I first became aware of her, she was about 80, working every day, um, partnering with brands um, like Louis Vuitton. She's she's uh, partnered. Part, uh, Louis Vuitton has partnered with her. Um, I think it's Louis Vuitton. Anyway, point. Vincent had no doubt of his talent, and it was infuriating to everyone around him. He did not have imposter syndrome. What he suffered from, uh, what he suffered from was, was societal ambivalence. That's what he was fighting against, and I just had that conversation again yesterday when I was having um, a, a little bit of a meltdown. Um, but once again, he wasn't su suffering from uh, imposter syndrome. He was fighting a world that didn't give two craps, and then all of a sudden they did. So, Eric, I don't understand imposter syndrome. And yesterday was another one of those disappointing days in an artist's life that we're just supposed, supposed to suck up and deal with. And after a while, it's exhausting when you know your worth and you know your skills and you know what you're capable of. And you're just sitting, you're not sitting around, but you're just working, working, working while you're waiting for everybody else to catch up. Waiting for the world around you to catch up and say, Michael Jordan and Nike sneakers, that's brilliant. or whatever it is. I become infuriated when I see um, artists like Coons who, who <sighs> he, <sighs> Jeffrey Coons in the 80s, I will never forget handsome guy, posed with a bunch of naked, mo half-naked models, and said, I'm going to be a brilliant artist, and I'm never going to touch anything that um, comes out of my studio. He came up with a brand new idea, not a brand new idea, but it was a, uh, they were calling it No Touch or something like that artwork. I remember reading it going, the emperor has no clothes here. It's a gimmick. That one is always felt like a big fat gimmick, but it's a gimmick that's paid off for him. But he was a good looking kid, post half naked, while living in New York, while living in Manhattan in the 80s. And people went, yes, that's brilliant. You're a genius. You don't have to lift a finger and you're, and you're handsome. So I get bitter and I get angry and I get petty. But what I don't do is doubt myself. 
All right, so continuing along, we're going to leave that behind, but continuing along the idea of intent, the conversations we've been having about intent lately. Um, this is Frida number 21 that I'm laying out. Um, get her little arrow nose in there. Uh, this is Frida number 21 that I'm laying out. Obviously, I've done... We've done the layers, the gesso, we've grayed the gesso, the black and white gesso, we've grayed the black and white gesso down this so that the paint will play with that. <coughs> and also so it'll help keep me confused and moving. I put down the aerosol colors. Didn't put down as many textures, like normally I put textures in the clothing especially. Didn't do that here. She is wearing heavy necklaces in the reference. And these are actually necklaces that are repeated. Her jewelry, like every other person, her clothing and her jewelry are repeated over and over and over again in the photographs as she wears them. So what I might do is go in and do detail, kind of break it down with a couple more aerosol colors, but I'm, I'm not sure right now. So I'm just sketching in basic shapes. I'm just sketching in basic shapes using, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, phalo, I don't know how to pronounce it, phalo blue. My favorite, my favorite P-T-H, A-L-O blue. Um, and uh, transparent red oxide by Gamblin Colors. Tra uh, Gamblin Color, Gamblin Artist Colors makes a transparent earth red. We love that. It's a little expensive, so we get transparent earth red, uh, transparent red oxide by Gamblin. It's nine. It's their nineteen eighty version, so it's a little less expensive. And what makes it a little bit less expensive? It's actually it has the same effect. The higher priced uh, uh, transparent earth red and the uh, transparent red oxide have the same effects. The thicknesses are just a little bit different. The, the standard Gamblin brand as opposed to the Gamblin 1980 brand, a little bit different. The step down is that the 1980 brands don't have as much marble dust in the paint. That's what makes them less expensive. But other than that, um, I'm really happy with the less expensive brand. If it's all you can get, it's all you can get. But I strongly suggest trying it, I always have. But that's what I'm using here to lay out um, layers, the first oil layers of, of Frida Kahlo on top, you know, on top of all the others, black and white gesso, the aerosol colors, I'm now laying down the oils. And we don't want to go in heavy at first, it's just light, 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 mineral spirits mixed with oil laying down shadows and ideas and notes. This isn't the beginning of the, con I mean, this isn't the end of the conversation. The one brush stroke isn't the end of the conversation um, in this. It's the beginning of the conversation with the canvas, with the figure. So I wanted to touch on, as I said, um, intent. We're gonna talk about intent and layout of the figure, or intent and layout in the reference material. In our 5.30 in the morning, our neighbor might still be asleep voice. Um, uh, so, with these Frida's, I'm pushing the head to the top of the canvas. And it's for a couple of reasons. Let me drink my coffee. Hang on. And it's for a couple of reasons. The main one being, we all know the top of Frida Kahlo's head. We've seen it 80 gazillion times. We know she wears the big flowers. We know she wears the big headdress. We know. I'm not doing it though, because we know. But also because I want people to see something else. I want them to actually 
see Frida, see Frida. Not go painting of Frida, pretty picture of Frida, top of her head, mustache, all done, story's over with. With the headdress, with the flowers, with the mustache. Okay, pretty picture of Frida, bad picture of Frida, end of conversation. I want them to see her, see her life. I want them to think about her, consider her, who she was, what she felt like in her broken body, in her um, broken, somewhat broken uh, mental and emotional state because of the broken body. You know, she spent her whole life reflecting on her broken body. And yes, on her inabilities because of the broken body, but mainly her abilities, which was her paintbrush. She spent her life focused on that. And she was relentless in the studio, in her brace, in, in a wheelchair. Um, I think the accident happened when she was 18 years old. She almost died. She was in this horrible bus accident where she got impaled. So she spent her life in and out of bed, in and out of wheelchairs. And it was painful and it was horrible. Every day was horrible. Um, it was, it was, phys sorry, it was physically difficult. And I think, I mean, my, when I think about Diego Rivera and her, I think she took on that particularly horrible relationship as a way to fight, fight back at life. In taking on someone who was controlling and hubristic, fat. I kind of feel like she was trying to work out not her own, not work out life and its injustices, just like everybody does, like I do, like I do all the time. Trying to, trying to. Uh, Trying to bend life to treat her fairly through, through Diego Rivera, which of course didn't happen because, as we said in the last video, she always said she had two, you know, two two great something brothers and her two great tragedies in her life, something like that, the bus accident and De Diego Rivera, her husband. So anyway, I can't remember where I was going. I don't want to uh, paint the top of her head because once again, it's pretty picture, dumb picture, Frida Kahlo, headdress, mustache, end of conversation. So I'm, I've got her pushed up. So we really have to address her eyes. We have to address the figure, the way she's holding herself. We have to see the person as opposed to all the iconic symbols that tell us who the person is. Let me move her up as a matter of fact. Oh, oh my stool. This is almost turning into studio mate in another state which I may, we may be able to get back to soon. We may be able to do studio mate in another state soon. We shall see. A friend wants to give me his old laptop. So then I'll be able to paint and oh, do live feeds. Let's do that. There we go. So you, you can kind of see where I've been going with this one. or where I am in laying it out with the transparent earth red and the, however you pronounce it, blue. The P-T-H-A, blue, blue. Yeah, that would be really nice if we could do Studio Mate again. 
because I really missed having our interactions. So I'm doing the outer line, sticking to, you know, sticking to where the shadows are. Around, the shadows are around, um, around the basic shape, like the folds. Okay, oh, this is hard. Um, like that fold. So I'm, obviously, I'm uh, hitting up. I'm writing, I'm drawing the lines rather around that particular shape, that abstract shape, that triangle. When you see my work, um, when you see my work, you can, s I've kept everything very plain, as basic as possible. All the shapes, all the design, so the viewer can see how the paint painting was constructed. And that painting is basically, or developing a, um, a figure, is basically nothing more than making a bunch of abstract shapes and somehow getting them to work into an image that we recognize, that our little brains go, oh yes, that's a person. I love looking at once again, Alice Neal's figures. I, I love Alice Neal for her fearlessness. I don't love all of her paintings. Some of them were extraordinary, like Egon Schiele. Some were absolutely extraordinary, the both of them, Egon Schiele, Alice Neal. And some of them are just utter garbage and ordinary, but in, in the best of her work, like the best of Shelley's work, these strokes are so fluid and the lines they move and they're visual poetry. But they're also abstract shapes. I just take a harder stance on making those shapes. Once I have the painting all built out with my hard uh, abstract shapes, then I'll go back in and soften them up. And it is intentional. I'm not a big fan of traditional standard anything, the traditional standard realism. To me, it just seems kind of lazy and like a mag magic trick. Although this could be seen as lazy and like a magic trick because I'm not doing the smoothie poozy lines. I'm not trying to make everything, you know, fondant and perfect. It's just, I think we've got enough people making perfect little fondant finishes and, you know what I mean, smooth and, and uh, very smooth and feeling like perfection-ish. I think we're all set. Especially with AI coming uh, into play, I'm thinking more and more and more that to, to, to distinguish ourselves as, as painters or as uh, developers, artistic developers, we show the human side. I had no clue when I started thinking this way or painting this way, but in the beginning, that AI would be a thing. And it didn't, it was there, but it didn't really cross my mind all that often. And now we're looking at a world that says, we don't want to learn the skill, we don't want to learn the technique, we don't want to learn about the materials, we just want to do it for, you know, as quickly and easy as possible on our, on our devices. We want to make the thing that makes us look brilliant using AI. So essentially, the computer's doing the heavy lifting. 
and then we'll pretend it's a painting. So I had no idea that was coming down the pike. And I started thinking about this, thinking about how the effects I wanted my paintings to have on the viewer. But now I think about it a lot. Because I want to, um, I want to keep that conversation about painting, about what it is to be a painter, about what it is to work with materials. I want, uh, I want to keep that conversation going and have the viewer be able to stand there and look at the painting and go, oh, now I understand. Now I understand how a face is constructed because there are basic abstract lines involved. I see it now. It's like any other profession. Cabinetry. I couldn't put in cabinetry. I couldn't build a cabinet. But then there are people that show it and explain it in simple ways. So it's not this big fat mystery. So I don't want the paintings to just be pretty, not pretty. It's a full conversation about the figure, about the portrait, the person in the portrait, but also about how it's constructed. And the other night I was showing people uh, a painting, um, actually I was showing other painters a painting and explaining why I do what I do. Like with not caring that the surface is smooth. Not, I, I want the big fat Shrek like brush strokes to be seen in a way to make that part of the experience. But some people can understand painting a little bit better and maybe feel more of a connection to it, to the act of painting and maybe feel more of a connection to, or also to, the figure. In all the raw brush strokes, in all the uncertainty, in all the certainty of the brush strokes, the colors. I want them to feel like they're participating We all know this. Um, oftentimes I'll talk to people about painting and they'll start off the conversation with apologizing that they don't know how by saying, I can't draw a straight line. I can't draw a stick figure. And I have to look at them and say, I can't either. I don't draw. That's a totally different, that's a totally different thing. Like teaching, totally different. We have that conversation all the time. Um, teaching is a totally different profession. There are people that can teach and they're painters. I'm not usually great at both, but there are, um, there are people that are painters and teachers or, you know, they're artists and teachers. Those are two professions that are merged into one human being. that are absolutely astounding to me. Um, not that I want to do them both. Um, but it's the same as someone who can bake and reupholster furniture. They can, they've taken two separate professions, two completely different parts of their brain have merged to be able, or, or can work together to do the thing, things up. So when one minute, you know, our little baker is making a cake and the next minute they're reupholstering furniture and I can't do either.
I have no desire to be, to do either. So I'm laying in the, uh, yeah, let me, it's, this is it, we're done. This is making the videos. And talking to people. And blah, blah, blah. Anywho. So as you can see, I'm going layer by layer by layer. And it is intentional. It is so I don't start off by overpainting, which is really easy to do. Just thin swipes of oil and, I'm sorry, oil paint and mineral spirits. Now, several decades ago, I did a paint painting that my cousins had. I don't know if they still have it or not. And it was my grandfather, who I never met, he died before I was born, hit his head on a cherry tree and died. But anyway, I was painting way back decades ago using just mineral spirits for the most part and oils. I also mixed in um, I used uh, a mixture of Demar varnish, linseed oil, and mineral spirits as uh, as a uh, medium, and it was really great. It smells so good. It should be a candle, but I also noticed that it yellows. But I kept that little jar there, and but primarily, I leaned on oil paint and mineral spirits. And I had a teach. I had a teacher who told me you can't do that. Once again, not a very good painter, but a teacher. And she was terrible at both. Um, who told me you can't do that? But as it turns out, you can. You can do paintings entirely using mineral spirits and oil. And how do I know? Because our little friend Vincent did it. When he went out into the fields, when he went into town, uh, indoors, outdoors, doing portraits, you know, out in the um, high winds and, um, you know, adventuring around, he carried mineral spirits with him. That's all he used, mineral spirits and oils. Now, I was under the impression because of this one teacher that that would crack, it wouldn't last that you needed something more solid to hold it together, to keep it all from cracking. A glue, which would be a medium, like our Neil McGill. Turns out you don't. Take a look at Starry Night and all the thick paint, the paint, thick, thick, thick uh, brush strokes involved. Our friend Vincent, did that with mineral spirits, mineral spirits and oil paint. And there's not a crack to be found. So whatever your name was, teacher, it was really awful. She was such a mediocre teacher. Um, mediocre painter. She had one painting she would take to class year after year after year. And she would show everybody how, what a genius she was using this one painting, the only big, the only one she actually ever finished.
That's why I talk to other artists. Glean information from other artists as needed. speaking of teachers and also intent when I was uh, probably 10 12 my mom came to me and said uh, there's a painter up the street and she teaches and I was like Ugh. I just went oh something in my stomach said nope and my mom said do you want to go do you want to learn from her I want to take you to classes at her house. Uh, do you want to learn from her? And I was like, no. Something in me said, don't, don't do this. I didn't know what this woman painted, but I knew, you know from looking at people, it's going to be sand dunes and teddy bears, and little boats and lighthouses, and just stuff that's unchallenging. I knew nothing about paint. I loved I loved the smell of my paints. I didn't know how they worked. I didn't know how to use them. But something said, something in me said, if you go down this route, you're going to be trapped. I ended up in my own little sand trap anyway, growing up in a in a community that valued um, seaside kitsch over culture, over actual culture and challenging artwork, but we had a neighbor that moved in. Mr. Toby, I think his name was. And this guy, he did Seaside Kitsch, but with a with a real big twist in it. He made it 3D. He was doing found object, object art before there was found object art that I knew of. I mean, well, I mean, obviously it had been going on for quite a while. Hello, Deshaun however you pronounce his name, the Um But this guy was taking, you know, pieces of wood and uh, just all these found nutty objects and gluing them on and then painting. And my parents bought one of his and I loved it so much. Well, I liked it so much. Let's put it that way. I really liked it. And I would stare at it because in the light, the paint changed and with the 3D effect of the found objects, the shading changed, the lighting changed. It was just, it was really kind of interesting. I hear my neighbor. So it looks like we are doing a studio mate in another state, only not live. So you can see, I'm laying out the shape. It's one brush stroke at a time, a, a thin layer of oil and mineral spirits at a time.
So thinking back on the painting teacher versus Mr. Toby, who I would ask, could I come over to your studio? And of course he said no. He was an actual working artist. He didn't want to teach. Come to think of it, he didn't want to teach. He didn't want some kid hanging around. He needed to, he needed to produce. Now, now I'm realizing as I'm saying this how much he affected me. Seeing the opposition of a teacher-ish. She was someone who wasn't, she wasn't doing well um, in selling her work, hello, you know, like most of us. So she resorted to teaching and I could just see it in her eyes. She wouldn't be good at it. She seemed like a very cruel, cruel person and I didn't want to be around more cruelty. And also someone who was mediocre and average and did what everybody else was doing. And then there was Mr. Toby. Who didn't do anything that anyone else was doing. He took the, he, um, he was doing a bit of kitsch because he was doing the stuff around us, but in a different way. I remember our painting was like boats and a dock, but it was three-dimensional and honest to God, it had such a big effect on me. I would sit there and stare at it and watch the sun cast shadows. And that must be where I got the idea of uh, paint and light. It must have been buried somewhere in my little brain. Paint and light affecting each other differently or affecting each other in different ways. It sounds like I'm putting down all teachers. I'm not. There are some really, there are some really good teachers. I'm just not one of them. And neither was this woman up the street. I could see it all over her face. I could see her limited understanding and also her inability to go beyond this one little predictable box. I could see that she had no intent in her work. It's funny how you can just sniff that off of people. So I'm kind of doing, down here there's a, a dark spot so I'm kind of filling it in. But again, it's just another shape. This, this is, look at it, it's a, it's a train wreck. It's all abstract shapes. It's all one big puzzle of abstract shapes. Not going in heavy handed, going in fairly light. Not expecting that that's the last line right there that I'll ever make because it's perfect and beautiful. Understanding that this, this, this is only part way through the conversation of creating, of developing the figure.
around here or there and start making lighter lines. Just as notes. They're not, it's not a forever period on the end of that sentence. Making a light line. It's just a note. Just on that to-do list. So once again, back to imposter syndrome. I haven't, I never really liked Frida Kahlo's painting. I thought, even as a kid, I would look at the brush strokes and think they're rudimentary. She was doing the best she could at the time um, and doing what she knew, but at the same time, it, bo it bothered me even as a 10 year old. But her portfolio, her opus portfolio, um, showed true intent. Yes, she painted herself 55 times. But she did other work as well. she did have people around her who supported her, her family. Diego Rivera, you know, um, as much as his ego would allow him to be supportive of someone else. But one of the things I've learned while painting her that she did not suffer from imposter syndrome. She knew exactly who she was. She knew exactly what she needed to do while she was alive. And what I see, um, what I feel, what I connect to in her, one of the many things I've learned to connect to in her is that, or what we have in common, is she has the same compulsion. Um, she had the same compulsion, the same overwhelming need to do this one thing, like our friend Vincent, like Alice, like Alice Neal, who was extraordinary. Like Yayu Kusama, the world is saying, just go putter, it'll be fine. And they're saying, no, I, I, no. I'm bigger than that, I'm bigger than puttering, I'm bigger than a hobbyist at this. I have to do this. I actually never thought of, um, of painting as a, or developing artwork as a compulsion. Yeah, that's where we are. Not too much further ahead, but a little ahead. So let's see. Let's see if we can turn this down. Can we 
can't see the top of my head because I'm very important. Sorry, Frida. You're not the star today. So I never really thought of um, developing artwork as a compulsion. It never, um, I never made that connection. Until a friend of mine, my friend Rita, like 20, 18, 20 years ago, she's like this award-winning um, pastel artist. My friend Rita Henderson. Um, she's like an award-winning uh, pastel artist and very, very good. And she just felt a need one day to learn how to do pastel work. Uh, landscapes and things, but with these really abstract shapes and colors. And it was, the way she was doing it at the time was wholly unique. So I thought she was interesting. Her work was interesting. <coughs> and she built a whole system so she wasn't breathing in pastel dust. Um, she, she built this room and with a vacuum system within her, her easel or attached to her easel so she could create and I was vacuuming in the dust and I was like, God, that's brilliant. And she, she looked at me and she's winning awards and she's in shows and she's selling and she's doing so well. And she's extraordinary and she's brilliant. And she looked at me one day and she, she goes, um, I said, wow, you, you're doing so great. And she's like, yeah, I could take it or leave it. She said, I wanted to learn. I wanted to do this. I wanted to figure it out. I figured it out. And, you know, it's fine. I could take it or leave it. And I looked at her. I'm like, I, I don't understand. I, I very sincerely didn't understand. And I still don't. And she said, she said, Beck, painting for you is a need. It's your heart, it's your soul, it's everything that you are, it's why you're here. And it's a compulsory act that you cannot control. That blew my mind. She said, I don't have the same compulsion. I don't care that much. So I'm putting down the lights in her face, um, and I'm, as you can see, and I'm putting down these titanium buff lines. Ooh, she looks like she's growing a mustache and a beard with a little goatee. But I'm putting down the mus uh, the, the lights over the oranges. And what's going to happen is those those titanium buff lines aren't going to stay there. I'm going to take some of them off so that as we build up, um, I still leave room for the underpainting, the oranges, the aerosol oranges to come through. And the viewer will be able to see how the painting was constructed, how the figure was built. In different areas, anyway. I'm putting down that line because it's the how the where the face, the direction of the face, the angle of the face. But also Frida had a very definite line down down her uh, from the tip of her nose to her chin. She had a definite line. It ran right through her lip as well, her lips.
need to get more of that blue that I love that I can't pronounce. Uh. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. I'm not using the PT. I'm not using the PTHA LL blue. Prussian. Sorry, Pam. Pam and her husband Ed and I have um, developed a, a passion for Prussian blue. I can't believe I forgot that. Too confused. I do actually use uh, Prussian more than uh, the phthalo. Now what's nice about doing mineral spirits and oils is, you make a boo-boo, and just kind of wipe it off. Um, that does It does leave a shadow behind, but you can take more mineral spirits, kind of wipe it off, and it's a little bit more of a shadow, but it adds another edge, it adds another layer to the painting. That shadow. Frida, by the way, had the most extraordinary, enormous ears like mine. There's the top of her ear. There's the bottom of her ear. When I realized that, that she had extraordinarily warm, enormous ears like me, I thought, oh my god, we're more kinship. More kinship in that little Frida. So I was doing an event I can't remember where I was I was doing an event I think last week or the week before and this fellow came up to me and this is is one of the things I enjoy is learning about other artists or other painters that I don't know. I didn't know who Jack Levine was, the Boston artist Jack Levine, until somebody said, or no, I actually I found him in an encyclopedia, uh, a book rather, a book I had just grabbed out of the New Bedford Library one day, randomly grabbed book, randomly grabbed books. That's one of my favorite things. And uh, I found Jack Levine, but somebody had mentioned him to me and said, oh, you remind me of Jack Levine, the way you paint your colors. 
And so, um, and who was the other one? Um, the black and white painter guy. guy who did this and that's all that's where he stopped he goes I had a conversation I'm done that was a five minute deal I'm all done now that'll be ten thousand dollars or twenty or a million um, anyway I'm at this event and this guy walks up to me and he goes he's, he said uh, Oh my God, he, because he saw me painting on them. And he's like, you did these? And I said, yeah. And he, he goes, yeah, like, yep. Yeah. And he said, honest to God, I've seen your work all over town. And he said, I thought Sarasota had Ernest Beckman paintings. Ernest Beckman. He was uh, a World War II uh, German expressionist. His work is all over the world. Um, I think there's a ton in St. Louis. For some reason, he went from Germany to St. Louis. I believe it's St. Louis. But once again, I had no idea who, who Ernest Beckman was because I'm staring at my navel all the time. And I looked him up and I went, oh my God, you're right. But it was such a thrill to be compared to an extraordinary artist who was celebrated in his lifetime. Not just celebrated, but collected in his lifetime. I don't know about you, but when I see that, I go, oh, we won. We won that game. Another man knew his worth. In extraordinary times. No imposter syndrome there, Eric. So Ernest Beckman was his name. Jack Levine, again, Jack Levine. A painter, I think in the 50s, like 50, 40s, 50s, 60s, 50s and 60s maybe, in Boston. He did uh, political paintings. He was, he basically made fun of the police and uh, all the power in the city of Boston at the time. He painted political figures um, and just other boorishness and, and selfishness. He was an illustrator as well, but his paintings are quite subversive because they are taking on the powers that be. Uh, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts owns some of his work. So you can see I'm putting down lights as it's hitting the fabric in these abstract shapes again, in these little deliberate lines as people like to call them. But I'm only using a titanium buff. Not using a white. Titanium titanium buff. So it's basically a khaki beigey kind of grayish color. Like the color of linen if you don't wash it for a couple of years. Little linen jacket.
started an hour, so I guess we're doing a studio mate. Oops, I just farted. Uh, I guess we are doing a studio mate in another state. It was not my, my intent. But we, we're doing it. Franz, Franz Klein. Franz Klein did the black and white sweaters. Oh, that was going to kill me. Max Beckman or Ernest? Ernst. Anyway, B E C K M A N. I suppose there's no way to look this up and find out. There's no way to know. I am gassy. So I'm showing people, I'm kind of giving mini talks about the artwork at the opening the other night, again, like Forrest Gump. Then I went to the White House, again, and I met the President, again. I was at one of my openings, again, and I was giving an art talk, again. And I'm telling people, I'm showing them the layers and how we're talking about painting, you know, in each painting without talking about it. We're giving, having the viewer, we're allowing the viewer to have the conversation, you know, to understand and to decipher. And I'm standing there and I'm looking at this painting and I go, oh, chalk. Wait, I said, I just tend to forget about the chalk and move on. So within the painting, you'll, in, within almost every painting, you'll see chalk lines because I've already moved on. I don't mind because it is as part of the conversation it's part of part of saying this is how we do the thing um, and I learned that that was okay at the Norman Rockwell Museum that it's okay to use different materials to leave behind, to leave behind those little touches that are so human. Instead of trying to be, you know, provide this perfect, beautiful, pretty image, just decorative and doesn't say very much, um, I learned that you can leave down the 
pencil mark, the chalk mark, and it's okay. And it's really kind of fun and interesting. It exposes uh, the person, the person that's created it. And as I said, I also learned this looking at Vincent's Starry Night and seeing uh, the raw canvas showing through. He wasn't, he didn't, he wasn't driven by smooth canvases. And in the beginning he was, it was all he knew, was painting like absolutely everybody else, doing the same images with the same colors as everybody else. But he found his intent. He's, he was somewhat able to define it. We know that through his letters and his interactions with Gauguin. And to Luz Lutrec and all these other fabulous artist, artists who talked about him. We know that he was able to find his intent and his purpose. And, and to differ how not probably not intentionally but um, in understanding his own intent um, and what he was capable of he was able to differentiate himself from the other expression or impressionists instead of doing a you know more can can dancers and lighthouse oh uh, sorry windmills he went in a totally different direction his famous painting, The Potato Eaters. They're grotesque and they're ugly and they're bent and they're, it's disproportionate. And, and it, it really reminds me of freestyle, uh, freestyle poetry or, or the spoken word in physical form. Almost like busking on the street, you know, singing on the street in a raw, uh, in a very raw presentation. He, that painting was much maligned, the potato eaters, because it wasn't what everyone else was doing. The people were grotesque, they were ugly, they were dark, the colors were not um, decorative and, and pretty and easy to swallow. The image itself isn't easy to swallow. These are poor people sitting around a table with just potatoes. It's what they grew. It's what they had to eat and that was it. And everybody else was painting, you know, peasants in a more romantic idea instead of painting who they were or depicting who they were. So that one painting was much maligned. And he didn't understand why. He didn't understand why people couldn't see. So when you're throwing your f fists at the sky, and saying things that are your, are your truths. When you're throwing your fists at the sky or into the wind, and you're like, why? This is where I was again yesterday. Why? How do we make things fashionable? get me further ahead. Punching at the sky. Well, you know, nobody said this yesterday, thank God. Paint smaller, paint prettier, paint windmills, paint lighthouses, paint pretty people, eating pretty food. Vincent. When we're going through days like that, we have to remember Vincent wasn't always Vincent. He died young. He, he 
with schizophrenic, they all laugh about the crazy artists. People laugh about, oh, the crazy artists. Well, people don't start off that way. They're beaten into it. Yay, Kusama. Our little friend Vincent. And he will always be our little friend Vincent, by the way. But our little friend Vincent didn't start off mentally ill. It was years of people trying to cram him into the box they thought he should be in. You need to be a minister. You should be a minister. You should be a minister. You should be married. You should be married. You should be married. You should be a minister. You should be a minister. You should be a minister. Oh, you're painting now. You shouldn't paint. You shouldn't paint. You shouldn't paint. Oh, you shouldn't paint that. Oh, you shouldn't. One can only take that so long and take fighting for your right to exist and to follow that compulsion, that need, whether it's to be a plumber or a, a, a shelf stalker or a sandwich maker or a mechanic or, I don't know, an architect. It's a compulsory need to create and to develop. It's something you cannot control. There is a reason why. Then we got to figure out how to convince the world that we're right <laughs> about what we're doing. And that's where I am, is trying to, con <sighs> trying to convince people Fortunately for me, there are people then like you who see my value, who see past the, per the present circumstances into the other, the other level, the one that we're always trying to reach for, or the one we are always working for. Sadly, as artists, as developers, as crea creators, I hate that word now, um, creators is the live, laugh, love of the, of the artist language, but sadly for people like us, sadly for artists, people feel the need to pat us on the head and go, oh, that's so cute, and not take it seriously, and that's not new. Because either you're a serious artist and they want to beat you into being the type of artist that they would like, the buyer, the whoever would like, copy this person, copy that person. It's not new. We will underpay you. We will talk to you like you're a moron. Because we don't know how to do what you do. We don't understand it. So... We have this idea, society has this idea that painting, creating, being an artist is basically playtime and it doesn't take very much. We don't know how to do it. Most of us don't know how to do it, but it's playtime. So we're going to argue with you and put you in a corner and, and belittle you. We think back to Michelangelo. We think, Michelangelo, Michelangelo, but he had to scrape and, and bow. So it's not just now. And we think about the cardinals and the pope and, you know, the churches where they really treated him like garbage. We don't, half the time we don't even know their names. Most of the time we don't know their names. We know, however, Michelangelo. We know Da Vinci. Carl 
Carpaccio. Artemisia. Artemisia. You talk about an extraordinary artist. Who didn't have it in her to fit in a box. A woman painting at that time. A woman who was supported and who had her father. She had her father. She had her father at a time when the rest of the world said, you're just a little girl. You need to be taught to stay in your place, stay in your lane. Now, if you don't know, Artemisia, A-R-T-E-M, Easier. Look her up and you'll be like, oh, now I know who she is. You'll recognize the images. But Artemisia was apparently a very beautiful, very, very talented young woman. And all kinds of men were after her and she wasn't interested and her father wasn't interested in her having to give up her life, her artwork, who she was, in exchange for her husband. Well, one of her suitors, he wasn't actually a suitor, he was a predator, reminds me of other people I know. Old men who go after young women, those are predators. Not cute. So, um, this predator was bu bugging her father to let him marry her. And her father kept saying no. And this guy was sniffing around and sniffing around and sniffing around and sniffing around like wolves do. And she was young too. I think she was a teenager at the time. Well, he cornered her. Apparently they had some type of relationship. The father and Artemisia and this disgusting man. And, but she wasn't interested in him. And he didn't lack him. He lacked imposter syndrome as well. Massive ego, he's a man. Um, and so he raped her. Couldn't have what he wanted, so he raped her. Well, her father, and this is extraordinary at the times, at the time, her father once again fought for her. They went to court and they sued the man who raped her. And that was unheard of. she had to essentially prove at one point that she didn't want to be raped. But she was a strong woman. She held her worth. She knew her worth because of her father. He, he supported her uh, when everybody else, when culture and society was saying you're nothing. Her father was right there teaching her to paint supporting her as an artist in any way he could. Really extraordinary. It took a number of years, but 
she never backed it down. She never, never backed down because he never backed down. had the strength and insight to part with society and what was fashionable at the time. The belittlement and ownership of women. Because of him, we have these incredible paintings that this woman developed. It was one of the neighbor's ones. He should have taken them for a walk like an hour ago. So he doesn't care that much. Apparently. Anywho. So obviously I can talk about this all day long. I think he's taken one of them out so I can talk like a grown up. Um, I can talk like someone with a voice, Artemisia. So we can talk about um, artists now famous artists who have been in the positions that we are in, that we are in. And we can hear the voices, the out, because I don't suffer from imposter syndrome, the outside voices that are saying, be smaller, be less, make smaller paintings, paint kitties, paint windmills and lighthouses and paint things that are pretty. Or we can find our own voice find our own intent, <laughs> really understand who we are, and ignore the voices that are telling us to be less, to be small, to be something else. Go be a plumber. Go be something that I think is way more valuable than what you're doing. Or we can stick to our guns. and say, my life, my talent is as valuable as that plumber, that mechanic, that guy stocking the shelves, the kid working at McDonald's. My talent, my focus is just as valuable, if not more so. If not, maybe, maybe not, who knows. But I have to keep doing this. My soul, my heart, my nervous system, every inch of me is driven by the compulsion to develop artwork. And so, like our Frida, like our Vincent, like our Alice Neal, like every other artist that we talk about, we're just going to keep our focus on what we do, understand our intent, define and redefine our intent, the reasoning, the, the, the reasoning we do what we do, um, understanding who we are. And stay the course. Stay the course. Herman Melville wrote Moby Dick. Everybody went, wow, this is a piece of crap. sold, I don't remember how many hundreds of copies. It wasn't a big deal. He wrote Moby Dick, now considered an American classic. 
He wrote Moby Dick. It's one of my favorite books, mainly because of Queek Queek. I love Queek Queek. That's why I have tattoos. Um, but he wrote Moby Dick. And literally, the literary world told him it was trash and laughed at him. There were, re there were people who actually bought Moby Dick and they were like, ah. And there were people who bought and tried to read Moby Dick and went, nope. That happens with everything, with every, every venture. But then the artist and illustrator Rockwell Kent, who knew Moby Dick and had read Moby Dick, he decided he was going to illustrate Moby Dick. He was the first one. So Herman Melville lived, you know, wrote, wrote, wrote these extraordinary books, now considered an American, you know, an American icon. Another icon. He writes Moby Dick. New Bedford doesn't give a shit. I lived there, so I know. They didn't care. New Bedford could have cared less. Nantucket could have cared less. The world could have cared less. That he wrote this extraordinary book. This voluminous book. I kind of cut out when he gets into too much detail about war whales. At some point, you're like, yeah, I get it. It's a whale. Or, yes, it is a piece of rural Herman. So, he writes this book. But he ends up dying, destitute, unknown, destitute, and broken, Vincent. And then decades later, Nor Rockwell Kent picks it up and goes, I love this book. This book, I have to illustrate it. He is driven. He, he has the compulsion to illustrate Moby Dick. Illustrates Moby Dick. Rockwell Kent, for some bizarre reason, was a was a celebrated author, adventurer, super misogynistic cad, and awful. Which back then was funny, um, and was funny until about five years ago. But he was he was a, a he was a great illustrator. He did a lot of um, uh, you'd have to look him up, but you'd recognize his work. He was a, a wonderful illustrator. Um, he wrote tons of books about his adventures, going to Alaska, going to Polynesian islands or wherever he went. So he was well known and he knew this book, this book, this book that was being lost to history, lost to time and ambivalence and societal fashion and cultural fashion. Absolute ambivalence towards his, his book. Rockwell Kent went through and illustrated it, and it's 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 so moving. He managed to capture the the feeling of of Moby Dick in a very unique way, the spirit of the book, the spirit of Herman Melville, in a very unique way. Other famously, other artists have gone on to illustrate Moby Dick because this guy did it, so I guess I will too. I'll copy him. Um, you know, a bone of contention for me, with me. Painting the flowers on Frida's head, bone of contention. Why are you doing that? Find something else. So anyway, Nor uh, Rockwell Kent illustrates Moby Dick. It becomes an international bestseller and an American uh, classic. And uh, Herman Melville goes on to be considered an American treasure an absolute American treasure. And again, what a tragedy. What an absolute tragedy that he wasn't really recognized in his time. Because people were still reading the Bronte brothers and Charles Dickens and in love with this romanticism. Moby Dick does a lot of romantic measures in it, but it just, it just, it kills me. I hate to see this. I hate to see society making the same mistakes over and over and over again and not, not getting it. And there we are. So 
I forgot what my point was, but Herman Melville was driven, Rockwell Kent was driven, and Rockwell Kent went on to paint. I know about him because he painted a mural uh, at, at the Cape, he painted a mural for the Cape Cinema. I'm from Cape Cod, painted a mural that hangs on the ceiling of the Cape Cinema. And since I was 13 years old, I've been going to that, or was going to that theater and just staring at this mural where the, it wasn't just an image of, I, you could see where he was playing with paint and light and how they affected one another. Um, it, he is a whole nother story. His career ended tragically because he would not fall in line with uh, FDR and uh, World War II. He was uh, Rockwell Kent for all of his grossness and Diego Rivera-ness. He and womanizing, just ugh, ugh, all the stuff, all the predatory stuff. He was a pacifist. So he actually was speaking out against World War II, again, speaking out against um, a cultural norm. Uh, and FDR buried his career. He lost all contracts, literary contracts. He, he wasn't hired for um, illustrative jobs anymore. Uh, we all know that, you know, we had to step in in World War II. We didn't step in early enough, but his, his life was over when he started speaking out against being in World War II as a pacifist. I think he was a Quaker, I'm not sure. Um, either that or Unitarian, I don't remember. But anywho, his career was buried and, and off he went down into the depths of um, being lost to time and history. What a shame. You know, I'm kind of obsessed with people, as we know, who have had to fight and for themselves in extraordinary times, and who are being told over and over and over and over and over again, you're useless, you're worthless, you know, you, you know, you, you should, you should, what you do isn't enough, and, you know, you should, you should do what everybody else is doing. That's what, actually why I was awake this morning. I was up at 4.30 thinking about this and thinking how can I, um, how can I combat this attitude that no one else has ever seen to win, but I'm convinced I will. So that's my big thing for the day. We've been on for an hour and 40 minutes now. We did live painting. This is where we are with Frida. Move the camera over. So we've sketched her in in oils. She is just slightly sketched in. I have a lot of more lights and darks to go um, before we get her up to finish. Duh. Um, I'm going to show you one that's almost finished, and I keep adjusting and readjusting one section of her face. was 21 this one is number 19 and what I'm having a little bit of trouble with and let me see if I can adjust it with the camera on because I've forgotten to pull out a mirror and look at her in a mirror so let me see if I can use this as a mirror image to help me figure this out I don't have the reference material in front of me. I know that there is like this little spark of light right there. Every time I do that, every time I dab a, a spark of light on there, it gets weird. 
and get this feeling in my head, and I, oh, there's red, and I look at it and I go, Try something. Because the shape of the cheek should actually come down like this. Come down in that line. But I'm in the reference material, I know we have these actually very sharp, um, sharp uh, shapes in her face. in the only gilt into the oil so it's doing this thing that I love that I also find irritating where I put the brush stroke down and the neoma gilt pulls the uh, oil paint to the sides of the brushes I love it and I hate it today I love it and I'm finding it irritating at the same time just like that little section of her face And this is the time, too, when I start mixing in the omegilp into the oil. Because this is when we need the really decisive strokes. This is done. And we also want to... Oh, I kind of like that. And we also want to make sure that in those decisive strokes that we're reflecting where uh, the Neo McGilp is allowing the light to go through down to the aerosols, down to the lighter colors, and then bounce back out again. I'm looking at this, I'm using this as a mirror. And I'm also listening to an alarm go off over here. No, that's too smooth. somebody else would. I don't want to duplicate. Let's check this. Hmm.
I think you're also, oh, look at, look at how the sun is coming directly through my front door, the windows of my front door, and look at how she changed. Oh, Mr. Toby, Mr. Toby, my neighbor. Oh, Mr. Toby, the assemblage neighbor and where I grew up. We could have had so many things to talk about. All right, I just mixed that green with uh, Neil McGilp. Making it with blues, and then I get don't like it. I have to come back. Look at how the colors change, though, in the light. Look at how clear they are. <laughs> Look at how the colors are reacting to the sunlight. Now oh, I sound like Bob Ross. Happy little colors.
I love seeing how um, sunlight or light can change the way per we perceive an image. So she's not done. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna work on the embroidery, um, work on her jewelry more, get it to brighten up and or to pop a little bit. Um, but I've got to go shut that alarm off because it's driving me insane. And we've been at this for almost two hours. We haven't done a studio mate in another state in ages, but it's it's been nice. Um, thanks for listening to me babble. If you have any questions about the artists that, that uh, I mentioned, Jack Levine, um, Ernst, Ernest, or Ernst uh, Beckman, uh, Rockwell Kent, um, of course, Vincent, Frida, Yehu Kusama, Alice Neal, uh, Michelangelo. If you have any questions about them, look them up. Look up these extraordinary people, because you're going to learn more through Wikipedia than you'll learn through me. Uh, look up their images. Find out how they changed the culture and society around them. How their intent, their drive, their, uh, their unwillingness to bend to uh, fit in to fashion and fulfill other people's ideas of what they should be doing. Find out how and why and what the effects all that had. Look them up. Herman Melville, we go, eh, Moby Dick, meh, yeah, no big deal. Moby Dick, Moby, Moby Dick, oh, there we go, Moby Dick has been made into how many movies? It's been re-illustrated and re-illustrated how many times? The New Bedford Whaling Museum reads, reads it every year. They have a marathon reading. It's a 24 hour long reading. Gregory Peck, his, his career, when we think of Gregory Peck, we think of him in, in many different movies, but primarily, what do we think of? To Kill a Mockingbird, and Moby Dick. And it's be all because <clears throat> of this one extraordinary human being, Herman Melville. Herman Melville, who died penniless and broken and alone. And it's not fun. It's not fun, it's not funny, it's not romantic. It's really frustrating. It's a crime, it's a tragedy. And I think it's something that society, we as a society need to correct. We need to correct how we view the artists, not how, or how artists view themselves. And artists, you know, artists need to learn to say, I need to be smaller, I need to be less, I need to, I need to um, be demure and sit with my hands in my lap and my little mouth shut because all of society tells me, tells me and itself that the arts don't matter. Art and artists don't matter. I forgot where I was going, but anyway, we get it. I've, I've been, you know, bat, beating that dead horse for a while. But that's the culture we live in right now, and we need, we need it to change. It needs to change. Because without the art, without artists, who are we? We're people buying Fritos? We're people buying designer clothes? We're people buying watch gold watches? None of that's going to matter in the end. None of, I mean, it will, but it won't at the same time. Artists record, okay, I'm going to keep this up for a minute. Artists record history, human history, environmental history. Artists record who we are as a people through the work we develop that needs to be respected. It's not, artists don't need to think less of themselves because the greater society finds artists inconvenient because they want to make a living because they work to make a living it's so inconvenient be small because i just don't want to have to think about you 
Well, when you're wearing your gold watch, think about who designed it. It wasn't AI, it was a person. For now, when you're putting on your designer clothing, it didn't magically come out of thin air, and it wasn't Tommy Hilfinger or Yves Saint Laurent. It was a designer, it was someone, it was an artist is someone with the artistic ability who built that, who created them. So it's not the artists that need to change. It is a societal attitude towards artists that needs to change, like the attitude needed to change towards Frida, like the attitude needed to change towards Vincent. We're just going to keep having this conversation. So when you start to feel like you're beating your head against a relentlessly strong, unmovable brick wall like I felt at 4.30 this morning. You will hear someone validating exactly what you know. We are valuable. Artists are valuable. All right, go out, record history. Record, record the things that you need to record. Develop the things you want to need to develop. I am going to take a small break, and I'm going to go take a small break. All right, thanks. Here we've done it. Studio made in another state. I was not my intent in the beginning. It was not my intent in the beginning, and we ended up doing it anyway. Eh, that's okay. We're all up. Why not? All right. Talk to you later. Oh, this is Catalyst and Company. If you'd like to help support Catalyst and Company, all the links are down below, including links to Cash App, PayPal, T Public, Patreon, where you can supply monthly support and you get a nice mug in the end, or a t-shirt, or whatever. Um, it's either Simon or George Howling. Um, uh, but also my galleries. So if you're interested in anything you've seen paint me painting, like the Frida, uh, all the links are down below, uh, but contact me as to who you need to contact. All right, take care. Ready? Ready, carries the multiple carries. Ready, Brenda? Ready, ready, Eric? And Vincent and Frida and Alice and Ernst or Max, whatever his name is. And here we go. Ready? Near. Near. Uh, long morning. Ready? Okay, here we go. Ready? Cheer. Cheer. Near, near, near. Point.